Welcome, everyone. Good evening. We, we're so thrilled to have you. Uh, my name is Yuri. I'm a co-founder and CTO at Latitude, and today's our very first Tech Talks by Latitude. So today we're going to focus on kind of helping you uh, build your startup for success since day one. And um, so, yeah, on, on my side, I mean, a couple of years before I joined Latitude, I was also a, a founder at another startup. There were three technical co-founders, and we wished like literally every single day that something like Latitude existed so, to help us on our early stage journey. Um, and kind of jumping, jumping into the next slide here, here are some of the things we've done at Latitude to, to help founders, right? So first is community. That's the first thing we've built. And now we're over 100, 1,000 founders and angel investors across LATAM. Fun fact, the founders in our programs went on to raise more than $500 million in follow-on investments. So we, we know we're onto something there. Um, and basically everything is focused on the community to provide people with support so they don't feel alone. Uh, connecting with each other to get the best advice from upper <laughs> Latam. Um, and, and also, you know, of course, um, even finding things like customers and, and deals. And then after that, we launched uh, our fund because the, the deals we were seeing or the, the founders we were seeing in the community were just phenomenal. So we decided to launch a pre-seed and seed fund. We've done over 100 investments at this point in about a year and a half. Uh, and amazing companies like Pomelo, Bihub, and many others. Uh, and so we're, you know, we're super excited about how that's going. We're going to keep expanding on that. And last but not least, we're building products for founders, right? So tools that help them get off the ground. So why are we doing that? We felt like community and capital were a great start, but then LATAM lacks kind of fundamental infrastructure that people in the U.S. take for granted. So for example, if you're starting in the Silicon Valley, you know, you, you can easily uh, form your startup, uh, you know, on Stripe Atlas. You can get business banking with Mercury. Um, and then you can set up your cap table with Carta. And that's just not true in LATAM. A lot of these fundamental things that are just kind of missing. So what we're, you know, we're envisioning building is like a startup OS to help the next generation of founders succeed in the region. Um, and so onto the next um, kind of challenge that we see founders face in Latin America is building solid technical teams. Every single founder I talk to from our community always says, hey, please help me find a CTO, technical co-founder, tech lead um, for early engineers. So we're launching this series of tech talks to really kind of, uh, you know, help develop more technical talent in, in the region and also get some of the engineers excited about joining, uh, joining early stage startups. Because I think a lot of folks want to be like, you know, Ed from New Bank that went from, you know, um, basically day zero to, to the IPO. But a lot of times when I talk to uh, engineers, they don't really understand what early stage means, what kind of challenges are present in that stage, and kind of like what equity means for them in terms of the upside. All right, so uh, without further ado, let's, let's hop on to the next slide. And uh, here I'll present our speakers today. We have Danny from uh, Corner Shop, is a co-founder and CTO. Um, and, you know, Danny built Corner Shop from scratch. Uh, later was sold to Uber for over $3 billion, which is, you know, makes it one of the biggest successes in, in Latin America. And um, I think fun fact also that Danny composes music. So every time I'm on the call with him, I'm always amazed about all the amazing <laughs> musical instruments you have uh, in your office. Danny. How's it going, man? Hey, thank you for having me. Very happy to be here with you guys. Awesome. Welcome. And yeah, I'll just present our second speaker here real quick, and then we'll hop over to, to Danny for questions. Uh, so yeah, the second talk is going to be from Jared Schaber, which is our very own principal uh, engineer here at Latitude, who's building some amazing tools for founders. Uh, prior to Latitude, um, Jared worked with Haskell in production for a startup in Silicon Valley for over four years. Uh, and then prior to that, he was my co-founder at a startup in Brazil. And prior to that, he slept on my couch for like a month um, before moving to Brazil for five years. So that you know, this, there's a funny story behind it. And I'm, I'm so happy that he, he moved down here and, and spent some time. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and, you know, start, over, uh, start with questions for, for Danny. The format is going to be pretty much 30 minutes with every, every speaker and then 10 minutes with your name. I'll start off with my own questions for Danny. And then uh, the team already shared the Slido link with, uh, with everyone. So please add your questions there. We love uh, making it more interactive and, and hitting up the questions from, from the community and the, and the rest. So yeah, uh, Danny, 
let's start off with the kind of like the the one that a lot of founders ask me when they I, I think when they're asking me like help me you know recruit somebody help me find a co-founder I think what they're asking is kind of like what motivated those folks to join right so in, in your case uh, what motivated you to to get onto this kind of risky path of being a, a founder? Well, I'm I'm very very old, probably older than than anyone in the audience. Um, I'm 42, and I started uh, studying computer science uh, in '99. So um, you know, back then, uh, this was prior to the dot com bubble bar burst and. Um, and all that, you know, so um, I guess uh, kind of my interest in in computers uh, on the internet, which back then was called the information superhighway and things like that. Um, you know, I I started getting asked by, by friends, by classmates, hey, I have a friend who wants to build a website, you know, this new thing, the internet and you, you must have a website now, you know, because that's the future. So, you know, I, I knew how to develop websites and how to build like, like small programs that could run on a web browser and things like that. And, and that's how I got started. You know, I was pulled into this uh, by the market, if you will. And after a while, you know, someone was like, you know what, like I need, I need a a company invoice. It's not good uh, that you're giving me a personal invoice on your name. You know, I need to. So, you know, like the reason why I incorporated my first business, which I did with Chuck, my co-founder at Corner Shop, um, you know, we've been working together for over 20 years now. Um, we started, you know, this business developing websites and whatnot, and we started learning more and more about it and, and how to do it. And I was still a student when, when this happened, you know, I was 21. And by the time I finished studying uh, computer science, which I interrupted for a while to study music, um, you know, I, I, I knew that that was what I wanted. And I was also realizing by then that I was in the tech industry, in the inter internet industry, but I was still selling man hours and that's not scalable. Like if you are going to be on the internet business, you need to be on a scalable business that can scale uh, faster than you need to scale people and coffee machines and chairs and desks at your office. Uh, but I was in a business that, you know, if we needed to double the business, we needed to double the amount of people, the amount of desks and chairs and coffee machines and whatnot. So we, I, 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 I realized early on that I wanted to, to be on more scalable things. And I started my first startup uh, with Oscar. My, co my other co-founder at Corner Shop in 2007. So I also been working with Oscar for over 15 years. Yeah, amazing. And, and that connection is so important, uh, knowing each other well. Um, I guess that's a, that's a good segue into the next question is like, how did you divide responsibilities with your co-founders in the early, early days of Corner Shop and how did that evolve kind of over time? Yeah, one of the great things about having worked so much with these guys, you know, for so long is that we know each other very well and we know each other's strengths and weaknesses very well. So if you throw us a task, we already know who, who's going to be the one who's going to do it, you know. And, um, you know, at the beginning of Corner Shop, of course, we all did everything. But... Um, I was more into writing code and, you know, I built the first version of the shopper app. I was, uh, you know, writing the first version of the dispatcher and a bunch of things uh, at Corner Shop on, on the back end. And Oscar was more on, on the front end of, or, or customer facing side of, of the product. He was testing the interfaces, designing interfaces. And, and Chuck was the COO and he was uh, more into the operations and how we can abstract reality and uh, model it in a way that can be controlled by software, you know, which is basically what you do with logistics. And in the end, Corner Shop is a logistics engine, you know, that basically dispatches orders from customers to shoppers that are spread all over a city. And you need to find the most efficient uh, way of, of, of assigning those orders, you know, so it's cheaper and 
and faster. So, you know, but the three of us shared a lot of things and we would brainstorm together every day. And, you know, so I would say the three of us were pretty much very involved in on everything. Awesome. Yeah, I just recently was asked by a founder in the office hours, like, hey, I'm a CTO. I found so overwhelmed by all these things, you know, building product and, and the technical side. And yeah, I think the example you gave is perfect on one of the ways to divide that responsibility is having like your non technical co-founder, you know, for example, uh, validate the screens or like talk to the users and do that validation because there's a lot of work there too. Um, right. And what were some of the key technical challenges you had to solve on your product, the corner shop? Um, well, I would say it had, it, everything that had to do with the fulfillment of the orders, you know, from the dispatch to the uh, picking and delivery, you know, how to optimize that and how to to do it efficiently, uh, lowering costs and all that, you know, um, because especially at the beginning, when you don't have the density you need to operate a business like this more easily, you need to, you know, imagine you launch the service, you only have two shoppers, you know, one in the north of the city and one in the south of the city. And, you know, you get an order, you assign it to the closest shopper. That's easy, right? But then you, you get an other order in the south of the city, but the available shopper is in the north of the city. So what do you do? Do you assign it to the shopper in the north who's going to have to travel 15 miles to get there? Or do you wait for the guy who's already there to finish the order that he's doing and giving it to, to, to that guy. So, you know, that, that sort of decisions are, are very, very hard to model, very, very hard to optimize because it's not, uh, it's not a problem that you can, uh, like with one best answer, you know, there are multiple best answers depending on, how, on what you decide is best, you know? Is it better to travel less kilometers? Is it better to show up on time? Is it better to say uh, on gas? Is it, is it better to, to have a faster shopper? Because you know, like the, the variance between a fast shopper and a slow shopper is the same. So if the order has 100 products, like a fast shopper is gonna do it in 100 minutes and a slow shopper is gonna do it in 500 minutes. And that's like, what, six hours, seven hours or whatever? So, you know, um, it's, um, it's a very complex problem and, you know, you learn, you measure, you improve, and, you know, this is, uh, these are parts of the systems that were ever evolving. We never said, okay, this is it, it's set in stone, we're never going to change it ever again. We were always improving, always measuring, always, uh, you know, coming up with new ideas on how to solve this. And, you know, that's... Um, Quite complex. Yeah, and I think you hinted at something interesting in your answer regarding ops versus software. I think a lot of the startups are facing this challenge, especially the marketplace side of things. You know, folks like Rappi, Uber themselves. Um, so how did you balance kind of testing things and learning quickly with ops folks versus solving problems with software? Because, you know, software has a certain cost of implementation as well. Yeah. We, we always uh, chose the software path. Like for us, operations was mostly software, you know, uh, unless you couldn't do it with software, you know, because if you need to deliver t-shirts and bags to the shoppers so they can wear their corner shop t-shirt and, and give customers corner shop bags, you know, you need to meet them somewhere and give, give them the, the, the things they need. But, you know, if you can use software to solve a problem, which in our case we could, because the brain of Corner Shop was software and that was the dispatcher and all these things. Um, you know, like you just do it with software, you iterate, you create two versions, you measure what happens when I use this version or, or that version and you kind of A-B test, measure, improve. Um, but the great thing about software is that you can measure a lot of things and, and with that, uh, you can you can make the the right decisions and and improve the the operations you know makes sense and and curious what was the tech stack when you started uh we started with uh python with django and 
yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, Python Django was a monolith with Postgres on, on the database. And that's pretty much the same stack that we use today. We didn't change much. You know, it, we changed certain approaches. We ended up splitting data stores that didn't scale and things like that. And we ended up having, I would say, a distributed monolith, but but still a monolith. And, and you know, I feel like that saved us a lot of development time, especially in the early days. And I feel like, you know, a mistake that many entrepreneurs make is that they optimize prematurely so they are like oh when i have a trillion customers we'll need this and that and microservices and everything need to be needs to be real time and whatnot and you know like what you need to do is test your idea test uh, build an mvp launch that and hopefully and hopefully your mvp is built in a way that allows you to to improve and to grow uh, without having to throw away everything you built. And having said that, you know, we were reaching a point uh, or we are reaching a point uh, at Corner Shop where we might have to rewrite certain things that are very hard to scale with the current architecture, but we are on year seven, you know, of the business, you know, so that's yeah. fine. But, but, you know, like you, you, you don't, you shouldn't be wasting time over optimizing or prematurely optimizing things that you problems that you're not sure you're going to have. I'm so happy you mentioned that, Danny, because my perception is that most of the content is produced by folks at later stage companies because you have the kind of infrastructure and the time to do it. But then people exactly. in the early stage companies read that content and they're like, oh my God, I need the you know Kafka cluster running tomorrow or else my company is going to fail. And it's, it's a trap. Right, right. <laughs> Exactly. You need to you need to use the technology stack that you're more, the most comfortable with, build an MVP and take it from there. But you shouldn't uh, optimize prematurely because many of the problems you think you're going to have, you end up not having. And many of the problems you don't imagine you're going to have, you end up having. And you don't have a crystal ball, so you never know how uh, everything is going to evolve. And especially in these systems, there are many moving parts. And sometimes, you know, like there's a bottleneck somewhere you didn't expect and, and you need to fix that. And, you know, so I wouldn't uh, spend too much time uh, designing super complex systems when, when you oh, should be designing an MVP just to make sure that the market wants what you're building. Totally. And that being said, like looking back, would you change anything in your stack if you were building Corner Shop today from scratch again? Not really, because, you know, we sold the company to Uber, you know, with, with that stack and, and we didn't have a lot of problems. We had to refactor some things, rewrite some things, you know, take a little like data stores out of the main data store, things like that. But we, but, you know, like you're going to have those problems anyways, no matter the stack you're using or how you're designing the architecture at the beginning or whatever. So, you know, I feel like, we made mistakes. Um, I'm not sure I, I have a recipe that I could share. And, and I also think, you know, like the, the journey of every company is different, you know, so I don't believe too much on giving this sort of advice that, that would apply to everyone because everyone's company is different. The timing of your company is different. You know, I started Corner Shop in 2015 and, you know, like I, I had a set of tools that at my, at my disposal that I used to build this. And, you know, it, it turned out that it ended up working, but, you know, like um, you never know uh, what's going to happen or what the difficulties will be. So I, I feel like you should, uh, when you're building a system, you should optimize for, for the present, like for, for delighting your customers in the present. That should be your goal. And, and then like the life and, and time will tell you uh, where to go and what to optimize in the future. Makes total sense. So we actually have quite a few questions uh, already on the Slido. So I think we can switch over to those. Uh, if the team can help mm -hmm. me paste in the chat the, the question from Alessandro, that's the most uploaded at the moment. So Alessandro is asking, how did you manage tech debt uh, as Corner Shop was scaling? Well, um, you know, uh, 
sometimes you need to rewrite something because it's it's going to stop working very soon and you can tell you know like the database is struggling with this we need to rewrite this maybe change the data store maybe refactor this whole thing many many features you build with something in mind and then the market takes you somewhere else and you you design something that that doesn't fit it's like a square peg in a round hole you know and then you're like i need to rewrite this because now i know exactly what i need to build i didn't know it when i started so now i need to rebuild it or rewrite it or refactor it and um but you know like you you have uh limited resources you have limited time you have limited engineering hours you have limited uh, amount of money for paying AWS or Azure or whatever you're using. And, and, and you know, you have all these restrictions and, and sometimes the decision makes itself. You don't make it, you know, if your budget for AWS is X and suddenly you're spending two X, then you need to figure out how to lower the cost. And sometimes that involves rewriting parts of your stack, but sometimes it involves you know, turning off a feature. I don't know. It could mean many things, but but you need to do what you you gotta do what you gotta do, right? Like, and um, I always had this pragmatic approach. Um, you know, no rules and pragmatic. I I I, I think that a mistake that many entrepreneurs make is that like, oh, I read this lean startup CTO book, and it says this and that, so that's what I'm gonna do and. They don't even think whether that applies to their business at that point in time or or not. And, you know, so that's why I'm, I'm not great at giving advice because I don't believe much in it, uh, especially when it's not very customized for your stage, for your business, for your circumstances. And, um, you know, and I, I, I just like to be pragmatic and and think about the restrictions you have on everything and, and, and how you get out of there. Yeah, sounds like a great advice. And it sounds like a lot of the restrictions you kind of lean on have to do with business, right? Not, not just tech. So like understanding where the business is and what needs to be unblocked from the tech side. Well, you know, we had lots of bottlenecks on, on the history of Corner Shop in, in different stages and different parts of the company. Some of those were technical, some of those weren't. Um, you know, sometimes you need more shoppers to deliver all the orders you have, and it's hard to get shoppers for whatever reason. For example, during COVID, hard to get shoppers because shoppers didn't want to work because they were scared of getting the virus, which is very reasonable. And at the same time, people were trapped at home, uh, not able to go to the supermarket, so they wanted to use corner shop more than ever. So we had a spike in demand. At the same time, we had a, a crash on supply. So how do you get out of there? And you know, and other at other times, we all, we had uh, problems with scalability. You know, servers, uh, database servers are not able to perform all the queries we need to perform, and on the time we need the server to perform them, and and then you need to rewrite, maybe split the database, maybe. Uh, you know, refactor your code, maybe change the approach, maybe something that was um, long polling, you you change it to real time. You know, there are, there are many, many things that you, challenges that you face and you just need to solve them as they appear, you know, problems appear where you least expect them and then you need to change plans, solve the problem and move on. Cool. Um, the next one is, um, I think we're already pasted here in the chat, is, is from Anonymous. Uh, but uh, the Anonymous asked, like, what are your two or three must rules or guidelines for hiring tech talent? So, you know, I, I feel like there are different approaches uh, at hiring, you know. Um, I personally like, especially at a startup, the approach of hiring entrepreneurial people. For me, the most important thing is that I'm hiring entrepreneurs because I'm inspired by entrepreneurs. I like to work with entrepreneurs. 
And I like people who feel ownership of what they're doing, ownership of the product they're building, ownership of the problems that are created or, or problems that just happen. And, and for me, uh, anything technical can be taught and can be learned. But attitude and an entrepreneurial spirit, you either have it or you don't. I, I don't feel like that can be taught. Maybe it can be inspired by, with time and, and so on. But I, so I, I, especially the first maybe 100 engineers that we hired at Corner Shop, I was super focused on, on hiring people with the right attitude and not necessarily with a lot of experience because I would rather train an entrepreneur to become a great engineer than uh, hire uh, uh, someone who's a great engineer on paper, but maybe is willing to work six hours a day and then is not gonna reply to emails, you know, or whatever, or, or doesn't feel the ownership. I, I feel it's needed, you know? Makes sense. Um, the next one is also from Anonymous and person asked, what advice would you give uh, to new chief technology officers in Latin America? Mm, I don't know. I, I feel like, you know, if you're the CTO, you're probably a co-founder. And if you're a co-founder, then you need to be good at everything. You need to understand hiring. You need to understand human resources. You need to understand taxes and payroll. You need to understand uh, how to talk to customers and how to understand what they want. You need to understand how to hire and fire people. You need to understand finance and you know runway and raising money. Um, you need to understand how to communicate effectively with your team and motivate them. And as a CTO, you need to understand pretty much everything. You need to understand a little bit of backend, frontend, uh, you know, data stores, databases, you know, uh, different approaches uh, at building a solution for, for whatever you need to build. And so you need to be a little bit of a jack of all trades and, and, and you need to, uh, you know, understand and move from the business to the tech and from the tech to the business and uh, you know so you, you need to be a little bit of a renaissance man and and try to be interested and aware of everything that's going on in the company uh yeah make, makes sense and um i guess there's another one that's sort of connected from rodrigo urbina uh, which is how did you make the transition from a tech to a business focused person? I don't know if that transition you know, happened or to which degree it happened, but uh, that's what Rodrigo is asking. So it didn't really happen that much because, you know, I was very involved in the business at the beginning. I was fundraising, I was hiring uh, not only tech people, but also other roles. I was, uh, you know, leading people as a founder of the company. I was doing many, many business uh, related tasks at the beginning, besides writing code and designing solutions and, you know, doing, I don't know, software architecture and whatnot. So, you know, I, I don't feel I ever transitioned from one type of role to the other, uh, you know, until maybe when we sold the company to Uber and then I, I transitioned a little bit to, to a more business role because that was what the circumstances required but it's not that i'm not interested in tech or or i you know don't don't look at those things anymore so in in my case i would say it, it wasn't um so much like like that i wouldn't call it a transition makes sense um there's another question from anonymous that asks about a process of migrating from monolith to microservices. It sounds like from your previous uh, answer that you didn't actually migrate to microservices. So just curious, what was that architecture no. like and how to distribute the system after yeah, scale? So, so I, I feel like microservices uh, in general are a premature optimization. Um, I feel like a monolith, you know, at the beginning is fine. And we ended up with uh, what I would call a 
distributed monolith, you know, a monolith with, um, with uh, different apps that don't interact between each other uh, directly, but through kind of an API. And, you know, I feel like um, the, the, comp the most popular company using this approach is um, uh, Shopify. Uh, Shopify, uh, they are the proponents of this distributed monolith, you know, which makes a lot of things easier, you know, deployments and all that. And if you have the right software architecture, the right software design, you can make it work. And, uh, you know, you might end up with every app within your monolith with a different database or a different data store. Um, but, you know, we started with the monolith because as I said before, you, you need to launch a product and test the market and see if people want to use it. And then when you realize people want to use it, then you don't have time to rebuild it. So you just keep improving it. And, you know, sometimes you need to stop developing new features to rewrite what you have or re refactor what you have. Um, but I feel that approach is better than, uh, you know, starting with a million microservices and then you want to capitalize a string and then you need to call the capitalizer microservice to to do that you know yeah totally it's uh orchestration can be a nightmare with that um yeah, yeah. the other one that i found interesting here as a, as a question also from anonymous is what to search for um in non-technical co-founders like if you were you know choosing a non-technical co-founder today like what would you recommend as the attributes to look for um well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to speak about the attributes I like in my co-founders. And I, I, I've had the same co-founders. I, I started my first company with Chad 20 years ago, as I said, and my second company with Oscar 15 years ago. And then the three of us have been working together since then. And, you know, we're brothers. And uh, I wouldn't start a company with anyone else but them. So uh, having said that, uh, what I like about them is that we're very complementary. Uh, both of them are better at a million things than me. And I hope they can say the same about me. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and we also share the deepest values about life, company building, integrity, ethics, and all those things. And so it's very easy for us to work together because we, we have a shared set of values and a, a shared vision for how to create a company, how to operate, how to raise money, how to work. And, and, and as I said, we're very complementary, like our skills, you know, if you throw us a task, the three of us, already know which one of us are going to do it, you know? And I feel like those are the two most important things, you know, having uh, separate sets of skills because otherwise you're going to be fighting about who does what and when and, and having like the highest level of trust possible. And for that, you need a set, a, a shared set of values and, and visions for how to work and how to build a company. Yeah, and I don't know if this was a, your a case for me. Uh, I felt uh, for you, but uh, in my startups, I felt that is that it's actually easier to connect with people that are like you. So, like my first startup, we had three technical co-founders. It was super fun to hang out, but then the company wasn't moving forward as as quickly as we wanted to because they were missing skills. And uh, I feel right. like right now, with Brian and Gina, we have like super complementary skills, but it takes time to build that trust and communication because you know people will challenge each other it's like oh why are you doing this on sales you know why are you doing this in tech so you know i guess to advice to folks is to be mindful when you're picking co-founders it shouldn't be people that you want to hang out with uh, but necessarily but like build a company with them yeah and, and what happens you know I, I was prior to starting my first company with chuck i was his friend and prior to starting my first company with oscar i was his friend i i loved hanging out with these people and, and as you start working together, the relationship changes a little bit. And it's not that you're not friends anymore, but you, you become more like brothers and, you know, like you cannot 
talk about anything that's not the company. So sometimes I spent months without talking to Chuck or Oscar about personal issues, for example, and we only talk about the company. So, you know, but 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 it's a good trade-off, I feel, because you know, like you like the relationship changes and then it becomes more like a brotherly relationship, you know. Yeah, co-founder is definitely like a special kind of bond. Um, yeah. I think we're almost at time here. So let's close it off with this last one, uh, also from Anonymous. What books would you consider must read to change the mindset from a developer to a manager? Hmm. I, I, I feel like, you know, if you, if you want to be an effective manager, you also need to think as an entrepreneur, you know, like you're running a little something and you need to, you have resources, you have constraints and you need to produce an output. And that's like a company in miniature, you know? So you can think of a business area within a company as a small company that have cost, uh, you know, revenue has constraints, needs to produce something for other areas of the company or whatever. And um, so I would read, you know, like the, the same books that I recommend any entrepreneur, you know, from zero to one, uh, uh, from Peter Thiel, um, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, uh, Ben Horowitz, um, what else, uh, High Output Management from uh, Andy Grove. And, um, you know, I, I guess the three are a good starting point. Awesome. I think that's also a good segue. We had a follow-up on the, when you mentioned you were looking for entrepreneurial skills and in, in engineers, Casio asked like, what, what does entrepreneur mean to you? Or like what kind of qualities you tested for to you see those entrepreneurial traits? Can you share a few? Yeah. So um, curiosity, people who are willing to learn with a growth mindset, they are not like, oh, I don't know that. So, you know, sorry, you need to, if you want that, then you need to hire someone else. They are like, oh, I'm not that, but no problem. You know, like, tell me which book I need to read and what videos on YouTube I need to watch. And I'm going to be a master of this in, in, in one week. You know, that, that growth mindset that with the attitude of I can, if someone else can, can do it, then I can do it too. And, and, you know, like the curiosity of wanting to learn new things all the time and following the industry to understand the trends. And, um, and you know, normally these people have side projects that they do just for fun. You know, I do this project because I want to learn Node or I wanted to learn Ruby on Rails or I wanted to learn Kafka or whatnot. And they are uh, learning and studying on their, on their free time just because they like to learn, just because they like to build things. And, and they are creative. They, are, they always have this urge to create and build and, you know, uh you know change the material world in some way and you know that's entrepreneurial you know that's uh, defines an entrepreneur the willing the willingness and and the desire to build something you know and and feel proud of it you know i built this with these hands you know and um not everyone has that That's great advice. Um, this wraps up the first part of our Tech Talks. We're going to switch over to Jared now. Dani, thank you so much for joining uh, and sharing your wisdom and kind of paving the way for the future CTOs of the region. And we're looking forward to seeing more of you at Latitude. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. This was a great time. And I hope that the, the audience appreciated what I had to say. I'm sure they did. Thanks so much, Danny. Um, all right. So, folks. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We uh, hang on. We're going to start with uh, Jared's talk now. So, Jared, uh, feel free to hop in. I guess some of our, somebody on our team will share the slides, right? No, I'll share my screen now, I think. Okay. Okay, cool. So, let's switch over to that. And so, Jared's uh, talk is going to be on functional programming in practice. 
Uh, Jared is very few people in the world that worked with Haskell in production, so knows a thing or two about functional programming. And yeah, excited for your talk, man. Thank you, Yuri. Yeah, there's a lot I want to cover today, so I'm going to dive into it. Uh, just to expand on why you should bother listening to me about any of this. Who am I? I was born and raised in the U.S. in Kentucky. Uh, I studied mathematics and computer science at the University of Illinois. Uh, there's a lot of famous grads from there. I'm not one of them yet. Uh, after that, I worked for two years in a healthcare tech company, and then I moved to Brazil. That uh, was involving Yuri, Yuri Sofa, as he mentioned. And then I worked at a Brazilian startup, a local one, as their first employee. That was a Ruby on Rails app. And then I started the startup with Yuri. He can tell that story on another talk sometime. And then, as he was saying before Latitude, before I joined Latitude, I was working for four years at a bootstrap Silicon Valley startup, uh, working with Haskell exclusively on the back end. Okay, so that's who I am. And today we're going to talk about, I'm going to do a little philosophy just to motivate the discussion. And then we'll get into foundations, um, code samples and everything, but nothing too technical. And then I'll talk about if you're interested in this and you want to do more functional programming at your company, the steps I would consider taking in the considerations. Okay, so before we get started, any discussion of programming languages, I think it's always good to remind people of Turing completeness, that every programming language anyone on this call is using or will use is uh, at least as strong as a Turing machine, but also only as strong as a Turing machine. So it doesn't matter how cool your programming language is, how new and fancy, um, you could code up the same thing in Minesweeper or Conway's Game of Life or anything. So now this, this sort of makes the discussion impossible. It's like, okay, how can we compare programming languages then? And I think it points us to the more interesting part of it that for any given program, because of this completeness, there's infinite ways you could have programmed it. And maybe one of those is the best, but that's not really the work we do as software engineers. Our work is never done, right? We, we never get a spec and then work and finish it. And then the software dies, right? Just sits there. We're always evolving it. So we're not really even looking for the best program in a particular moment. We're looking for the program that hits that sweet spot of doing what we need to do it now, doing it well, doing it with good performance, but also being easy to evolve because we sometimes we don't even know what changes we're gonna be asked to make in the future. So flexibility and other things can be a huge importance here. And usually a lot of these things, I mentioned flexibility, a lot of things come down to readability because if your code is more readable, it's easier for you to understand three months later when you come back, it's easier for your new developer that you hired to understand when they get started. And it's easier to talk about because what you're talking about makes sense. So continuing a little bit with the philosophy, we'll get to functional programming soon. I want to talk about something similar in physics, um, revolutions in physics, not the circles, but the, the big changes of ideas, the things that shatter everything and people have to rethink how they even think about things. So this whole idea I got from a talk by a physicist, Nimar Khani Hamed, and in this talk, The Future of Fundamental Physics, he wants to look at, in the past, what did these revolutions in physics look like? Because he's an active researcher and he's trying to guide researchers to find the next big revolution. So he's like, okay, what, did, what happened in these old ones? What did it look like? And one of the theses he makes in his talk is that even though every revolution, like going from Galileo to Newton or to Einstein, even though it allowed us to more accurately describe the world, it came with the cost. Some of the things we could believe in our old model of the world, we can't believe anymore. And some things just become harder. We have to do new things or consider new things we didn't have to consider before. But that at the end, this is all worth it because you can still find the old mental model in the new one, in the bigger one, but you can find it in its place. So quickly, I'll just go through some of these examples. So like going from Galileo to Newton, now you have this law of universal gravitation, so you can't just consider the forces acting on your immediate vicinity. Any massive body way across the universe can reach on you and tug you a little bit, and you have to consider that in your equations now. So we lose locality, and that doesn't seem great, but we needed this to be able to describe the orbits of the planets. And when these gravitational forces don't matter that much, you can just ignore them, and you can still do calculations in the Galilean way. 
And we have a similar thing going from Newton to Einstein, maybe even worse. Um, I put the equation up here. I don't understand it, but it's you know much more complicated. There's a lot more you have to consider. So not only do we have to do some more work, but we also lose things. Um, we Before we were unbounded, there was no limit to how fast we could go in the universe. Now there's a very clear speed limit. We also could believe, in, and Newton did believe, in a universal clock, that there was a clock that really kept time for the universe, and that's gone now. <laughs> that was a comfort, comfortable idea, but now we can't rely on it anymore. And I won't even go from Einstein to quantum mechanics because I don't understand, but I think you can see how the analogy continues, that there's a lot we have to give up there to more accurately describe the world. And so even though we're giving things up, it's worth it in the end because it's allowing us to describe the real complexity of the world accurately. Okay, um, Yuri yelled at me several times to not put this comic on here because it would distract everyone, but I think it's too perfect. So I know I'm talking, but I expect everyone to be reading the comic while I'm talking and I'll discuss it quickly. It's a little example where uh, someone is calling their friend, asking for their address so they can visit their house and their friend refuses to just give them the address. The friend wants to give them the steps, the individual directions, turn left out of your driveway, get onto the highway, take this exit. And the friend is telling them, look, I have a GPS, just give me the address, the GPS will figure it out. And that's what I see as the big difference between imperative and declarative function, uh, programming paradigms. That imperative, uh, you can, but you also must control the order of every operation. You have to tell it, the computer how to do it. Um, and you can also have side effects. They're scattered everywhere. In declarative languages, we don't do this. The goal is, and there's different levels of declarative. I'll talk about it in a second. In declarative languages, we try to tell the computer not how to do what we want, but just what we want. And when we try to describe it well enough that the compiler or the execution engine can take it and run with it and do what we need. Um, and quickly, I don't think imperative style is bad at all. There's sometimes it's the most straightforward, the best, certainly. And imperative itself was a big revolution. It's like our uh, Newtonian physics. Before this, remember, we had the dark ages. We were coding in machine code or assembly for specific machines sometimes. Uh, with almost no abstractions, we we're almost moving the electrons around ourselves. And so even getting to imperative coding, it is a structured form of coding. And it was a big revolution. Um, speaking of these inventions, I was really shocked in preparing for this talk to learn that in 1972, four different programming languages were invented that cover almost all the categories I'm talking about. In that same year, the C language, Smalltalk, which is object-oriented, Prolog, which is a logical language, and SQL were all invented in that year. And discussing SQL quickly, I bet a lot of you, as I'm discussing this, you thought you might think like, oh, I've only ever programmed in an imperative language. And I bet almost all of you have used SQL, have used SQL for database connections. And SQL is one of the best examples of a declarative language that I'm familiar with. Um, if you've used SQL enough or in high performance settings, this has probably annoyed you before that even though you know there's an index that Postgres or MySQL should be using, it's refusing to use it. And that's because it's so declarative. We only give it an equation. We say, hey, everything that satisfies this, please return it to us. But we get no say in how the SQL query planner goes about executing it. OK. Um, and quickly, speaking about languages, even though I did just declare SQL as the declarative language, uh, there's still a lot of asterisk and considerations there. And in general, I'm discussing this in the terms of programming paradigms and not languages. I don't think it's that useful to label particular languages because you can always use them in different ways. And as languages evolve, they keep on having new versions and pulling in features from other languages. So there's sort of a mix of all paradigms at the same time anyway, so it's tough to discuss. A great example of this is Java. Java is an object-oriented language, obviously. Except over time, they've been pulling in more and more functional concepts. I believe it was in Java version 8 that they added lambdas, anonymous functions, which is a hallmark of functional languages. So any, for any given language, I wouldn't worry about deciding whether your language is functional or not functional. What matters more is the paradigms of how we program in these and understanding that to know if it's useful for your use case or not. 
All right, so now enough of my blather, and let's actually get into some code and discuss programming. Going back to the physics example quickly, where I talked about giving things up, what do we give up for this revolution of functional programming? I have a list here. The first two are things that I, I'll argue are actually really blessings in disguise. The first one is types. Every value in a most functional programming languages has to have a specific type, and you have to tell the compiler this ahead of time. Um, we also, this isn't so much a problem in, in all type languages, but in more pure functional languages and more hardcore functional languages, they make you do more bookkeeping to be able to use side effects or shared state. So side effects, so shared state would be a variable stored that different functions can touch and access. And then side effects are anything that change the world. And if you squint, side effects can also be an example of shared state because you consider not only the state of your program, not only what's in the registers and RAM of your program, but also the state of the world. Um, so if I do a console.log, the, uh, the end user's browser console now has a line printed that it didn't have before. So the state of the world, the list of things printed in the browser console of user X has changed. And these have important uh, mathematical reasons and they, they give us extra power, which I'll get into in the next slides. The last two I won't cover as much, but these are more just downsides and they go together, debugging and performance overhead. The machines we're using, they map more closely to an imperative style, the, just the way the machines work, the von Neumann architecture. So you can more directly map the concepts of imperative languages or imperative style programming to these machines. And with functional, you have an overhead. Uh, quickly, there were in the 70s or 80s, there were people making Lisp machines optimized for the Lisp language, but I haven't really seen much work on this recently. So these extra layers of overhead, it makes it harder to debug because there's you know more going on that the, the compiler has to do for us that we don't necessarily want to understand. And then the performance overhead, this extra work. I 100% agree with the previous talk that premature optimization is the root of all evil. I've almost never see that, seen this language performance overhead be an issue in practice. Um, because usually it's your algorithm, it's your data structures, it's whether you cache or not, several other things that the language usually doesn't end up mattering. The case where I have been affected by it more has been in compile time. Sometimes if you're using very new features of an advanced language and you have a large code base, you could start to get annoyingly long compile time, compilation times that are annoying from a software engineering perspective of the time it takes. All right. So now I'm going to dive into types and a lot of depth. Side effects and shared state I won't talk about as much because they're more in pure functional languages, which I'll discuss at the end probably isn't going to be the first thing that you, the first step you take on your functional programming journey. Okay, so types. Uh, quickly, I really like types. I think they're very exciting. Um, and But they're one of those things almost like water for fish that you don't realize you've been swimming in them your whole life. Every language you've used has had types, um, sometimes more, sometimes less. They almost all have the same set of primitive types or built-in types. These are things like integer or number or string or char or array or a list. And then sometimes it ends there. Sometimes you only have those built-in types. Um, or sometimes you have those building types and then you can make a special type, which is an object type. And so because everything has types, it's hard to talk about what having types mean. So we talk about weakly typed or strongly typed. So weakly typed is when you only have these primitive types and only some things need a type. Strongly typed at the, the other end of the spectrum, the other extreme would be where every value needs a type. And if you're familiar with Java or something, this is the case in Java. In a Java program, every value needs to have a type. I have a little example Java program here in the corner. And if you're not familiar with Java, allow me to draw red boxes around all the types for you. If you uh, look at that, that's actually a surprising amount of characters that we're spending writing all the types. So this is one of the things we give up. We have to do this bookkeeping. We have to keep track of all this information that we didn't need to before. 
The thing that most modern functional languages have that's really exciting is they have what's called type inference. So not only is the compiler sitting there checking, making sure that all the types match, it also has a, a part that's helping try to figure out what the types are for you. So if there's any types that are obvious or even any types that aren't quite obvious, but putting things together allows you to determine the type, the compiler will do this for you and you can avoid this noise that you would have otherwise. And I'll talk about this a little more in the next slide. And then once you have types, the big two things you do with types are make them to construct them to make the data types that matter for your problem domain. This is type algebra and don't worry, it's simple algebra. And then I won't get into as much today, but then the other thing you do are destructing types. So you construct types, you make them, and then you pass them around and then you rip them apart to get the values that you need out of them. This is sometimes called pattern matching as well. So type inference, as I discussed, here's that same example, Java program. And now I'm gonna do a fake Java, a Java that has type inference, which Java doesn't. I believed, although apparently researching, they added it in some cases in the newest Java six months ago. But usually Java hasn't had type inference. So if you look at this new program on the right, even if you don't understand it, you can see how much cleaner it is in some ways. That I think every developer sense they would, they would be happier about the program on the right, even if they don't understand it. And in this case, almost every type, except for the functions, except for main, was obvious, right? You know, if we have the constant string, hello world, what other type could a constant string have but string? Um, once you get used to these things and how painfully obvious they are, it gets really frustrating going from a language with type inference to one without. As an example of one that does have it, here's a little TypeScript code. Um, so it looks a lot like Java, but you get a, it looks like our fake Java on the right where you get to ignore the types. On the second line there, that explicit number, I do even add a type explicitly. You're always allowed to add a type if you want to, even if you don't have to. Um, but sometimes if you add a type that's too obvious that I discovered the, the TypeScript compiler will even give you some shade in VS Code. It'll tell you, hey, this, this type was trivially inferred. This is trivial, so obvious that it's not worth talking about. And so this type inference helps with the cost of types, that now there's a lot less bookkeeping that we have to do, that when it's obvious, we get it for free, and that we only have to do it when it matters or when it'll help us. OK, the aforementioned type algebra. Uh, it sounds very scary, but it's really not that bad. I have on either side examples of two other algebras that you're almost certainly familiar with. The first one would be Boolean algebra. So where you have false and true, then you have logical or and logical and. And then not only that, but you can make variables. You can introduce variables uh, and combine those with that and and or. And then you have elementary algebra, the algebra that we learned in school as children. So you have zero and one, you have addition and multiplication. If you keep adding one to itself, you can already make every number, every natural number, two, three, and so on. And you can have variables. You can introduce variables and make equations with those addition and multiplication operations. So in a very similar way, mathematically it maps exactly, we have type algebras. So the languages are very different in what they call these things, but we just like we have zero and one, false and true, we have two different units. We have the type that can have no values ever, the uninhabited type. So I'll read off quickly. In some languages, this is undefined. In TypeScript, it's never. Other languages, it's nothing. Sometimes in the literature, you see this fancy bottom symbol. And then the next type we have is the unit type, the type that can only have a single value. Um, so this is nil, null, unit, and go. You can even make this as the empty struct. And then along with these units and the primitive types, you have operators that are similar to addition and multiplication. You have um, or the tagged union, the union of types. And then you have product or tuple types where you take two types and you stick them together. You say, hey, I have these two things together at the same time. And just like I had the examples of equations down at the bottom, you can make equations with types as well. Um, 
when you have an array, that's almost a type of equation because you have an array of something else. You can have an array of integers. You can have an array of strings. So the array of blank, that blank is just like a variable in algebraic expressions and these other algebras. So this idea I know is more mathematical than we're used to, but it's not that complicated. And if you put the time in to understand it, it's really powerful because now with these two operations and these two basic types, along with the primitive types that you have built into your language, you can start combining those. And then the, the more advanced types you make, the compound types, you can combine those. So really these, these, four, these two operations allow you to make all the infinite types that you would ever need to describe your program uh, or to exactly describe your problem domain. So this gets really exciting. And I'm gonna talk one more technical thing about types, but then I'll get into how this actually helps us in our programs. So quickly, product types I mentioned here, you don't use in the day-to-day -day world as much because usually they're not, they don't have good usability. They don't have this readability that I'm talking about that we want. And a record type is a nicety to work around this. And it's just a product type behind the scenes where we give names to the individual values. We give good names. So at the very bottom of this slide, I have an array, a fixed three element array. And beneath that, I have an object with three key value pairs. And so even though the object is much easier to understand, it's much easier to use. If you squint, and I'll change the spacing a little bit. If you squint, these values are really the same. They're, it, Want, they contain the same amount of data. One just has friendlier names and labels and accessors than the other. And so if you go researching later, there's a similar thing with product types. And then in TypeScript, they're called record types and other, uh, or sorry, in Haskell, they're record types. In TypeScript, they're object types. This make it easier to work with this idea of product types, but understanding it algebraically, it's, it's good to have some idea of what it means. Okay, so finally, and this is the part I'm most excited about. How do we use types? What, what are they, why is it worth this extra work? So I have here on the left an example user type. Um, so a, the user type is an object that has a name attribute of type string, an email type string, and then it, a friends attribute that's an array, a list of users. And then there's two ways, you, this code is TypeScript, by the way. And there's two ways you can write an array of users, the either array of user or user, and then the erase the list symbol. So let's pretend if this is my data type, if I'm a new developer, I'm a developer new to the team, if I'm looking at this and I'm trying to read through the code my first week and understand the code, what are some questions I could ask about this? I think, you know, maybe some are like, okay, is email required, is name required? Is one of them optional? Is one of them more the ID? With this friends array, what, what would it, is it possible for a friend to be repeated twice? Does that mean they're a better friend? Twice is good. And maybe you're asking, okay, these you're saying these questions are a little contrived. They don't matter that much because let's say maybe my ORM that I'm using to populate these from the database is always doing a select distinct star from users. So or select distinct on the friends. And so that you know friends will never have this repeated. But what's very exciting with types is that we can make things only as powerful as they need to be. Um, and I, what I claim what the promise here is that array is too powerful of a type. Array has the idea of storing a collection of things, but not only does it just store the collection, it orders them, it has a very specific order and it allows duplicates. So in this, little problem example, that's too powerful. We don't need that for friends. We're using too much power. It's like using a string when you only need an integer. Sure, you could just write the integer as a string, but why, why would you? It, it's including more things than you'll ever use. So here in the middle now, I have an example where I put a special class non-nullable around the email string. So, okay, now at a glance, I know that's required, that that can never be null. And I turn friends from an, an array of users to a set of users to more accurately model my problem domain. And again, though, even though your ORM might've known, even though you and all of your coworkers knew 
that that was the case. There would never be duplicates. Now the compiler knows that's the case and it's gonna keep you honest and it's gonna check every time you compile the nowhere down the line, even if friends gets pulled out of user passed to other people, you'll never be able to abuse that like you could accidentally before or make a mistaken assumption. And then once you get going, and once you get, this is a, a slippery slope, it, it's easy to get addicted to this, that let's say on this user object, maybe we also have some commenters that are users. Here a set wouldn't make sense because maybe if I comment, then Yuri comments, and then I comment again, we wanna see that repetition. So when it makes sense, we do use it. And then you can get, uh, set by the way is built into a lot of languages. Um, Xmas JavaScript, ES6 added it as a built-in type even. But then you can start adding more advanced types that the language designers haven't been smart enough to build in yet. So let's say you have a type of login method. Maybe that's uh, email password, SAML, et cetera. And before you would have an array of the login methods that that user has for their account. Well, we don't want users that can't log in at all. We don't want a list of zero or more login methods. We want a list of one or more login methods. And in type languages, that's usually very easy to define. So here I have an example. I got this from a library, FPTS, that defines a non-empty array. So it's not just a type of array. It's an array that has at least one element. And this is where I think functional programming is very much worth it. That as you go on, as Dan was talking about, you're always gonna have to refactor. It's gonna be ugly at first. As you understand better, you refactor and you make it better. Well, with types, as you, when you understand better and you refactor, you get to put that understanding into the types. And so anyone who joins the, the code base later gets to take advantage of that work. And as you keep going, things get better and better names and you more accurately model your problem domain. So this is where I believe that functional programs can get better over time, where sometimes iterative ones get worse, where you have more code and more tech debt. Okay, there's a lot more I'd like to say, but hopefully you're convinced and you wanna start using this in practice. How would you go about it? I think the first one is obvious, but it's worth stating. I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of languages are slowly adding functional features. So the very first thing to do is research your language, research the new versions of the language, and see what's been added. See if there's features that you can start using today with no other change. The next step, once you've done that, and so that includes using uh, more built-in types like set and things as well. Um, and sorry, quickly, another thing that I didn't discuss is the stream streaming uh, function. So like on array, you have for each and reject and filter, things like that. Once you've done that, step two would be to start looking for libraries to expand the functional capabilities of the language you're using. Uh, one that I used when I first started working in JavaScript in Brazil was underscore. Uh, it has a successor Lodash as well. They both, even today, they add a lot of nice functional utility functions that the built-in ExmaScript doesn't have. And another interesting one you could look for is immutable data structures. This deals with the shared state. I didn't get into too much, um, but these are very powerful. The next big step is the typed overlay. So this would be going from the language you're using to a, langu a transpiled language on top that adds types. So going from vanilla JavaScript to TypeScript, going from Ruby to Sorbet, which I believe is even built into Ruby recently. And then this is where I suggest you end. There's other steps you could take. From here, you could go to a pure functional language, something like pure script, Haskell, ML, Clojure, or Scala. But I think this will probably not be worth your time. Unless you have a very small team, you know you'll keep it small. Um, or if you have some access, special access, special advantage with getting talent for one of these languages. If you have a founder that uh, is well-versed in it or a strong first programmer. Um, so yeah, the developer, because the developer pool is different, there's way fewer of these programmers, they have different desires, it's harder to reach them. If you think you can have one or two senior engineers and then mostly junior or mid-level, it might also be possible if you start targeting universities that teach it, but it's not something I'd recommend. There's a lot of steps you can take in the interim. And then some advanced topics where you can even go on from here, it gets crazier. You could look at algorithmic testing. This was popularized by QuickCheck and Haskell. Domain-specific languages, DSLs and embedded DSLs. 
are very good for readability. Um, just like physics is looking for the grand unified theory of everything, we have new revolutions coming as well. Hopefully in five years, I'll be talking about dependently typed languages and then all sorts of other crazy stuff. And if you want to learn about it, my suggestion is that you apply and come work with us at Latitude and we can spend all day talking about this. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Jared. We have a few questions here already. Some have voted, so I'm just going to switch right over to that. So the first question is from Vincenzo. What's up, Vincenzo? I'm glad you're here listening to us. Um, he's asking how strongly you feel you should be defending the functional programming choice or even the current tech stack along the future engineering discussions. Yeah, so um, I'll almost not answer your question the way I asked. I think the best way to work around this is to not make it as much of a style question. Oh, are we are we imperative or are we functional? But to have code quality, code readability, and clean code be a concern with your dev team. And to bring in, don't just bring in functional programming because it makes sense, bring it in when you think it will, when you have arguments for why it'll make your code cleaner or more readable. Um, and I'd almost say if you're working at a company that doesn't care about Code quality, not at the expense of product. Product should always come first. But if you're working at a company that doesn't care about code quality, find a new team. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, I think, yeah, good shout from our team here, from Katya. Maybe you can stop sharing your screen so the folks can see kind of like more, more of, of us. All right. Uh, so the next one is from John. Uh, hopefully I pronounced your name correctly. Um, in your personal opinion, is the actor model going mainstream in the next 10 years? Um, this one I'm not as familiar with. Um, I know, I don't know if this is in regards to, I know in Erlang it's popular as well. I think, I doubt every, anything's going to, to win. I think the actor model, my hope is that all things like this will be easier to use when they make sense. I think right now, sometimes you have to make a choice of language and that decides what design patterns you can use. But my hope would be that in 10 years, languages are so flexible, whatever design pattern makes sense will be easy to use and to use in combination with others. Makes sense. Um, the next one is from Marcos. So Marcos is asking, how do you organize functions or services in the functional code base? Because object-oriented programming offers, uh, you know, object domain mapping. What's the functional way? Yeah, this one is a little trickier to be honest. Um, every functional code base I've worked on, usually there's been a, a utils dot blank file that you start dumping a lot of random functions, and then eventually that gets really big and ugly. But by then you have enough uh, functions that you can start organizing it and decide what makes sense to split up. The other nice thing about functional languages, and I didn't quite talk on the, the type algebra page, is that with generics, where you have type variables, you, you get to start making more generic functions, more abstract ones. So I wouldn't make a function that one function that takes an array and then another function that takes a, a set. I would make a single function that takes something that uh, is an iterable, that satisfies the iterable interface and then work over that. So in that way, you don't end up with as many utility functions as you would expect. Um, and then the pure functional languages also generally have a module system. So I guess that's the most pure functional way is that you have modules and modules bucket functions together, uh, functions and data types. So usually you'll define data types and you'll define the functions that work on them in a module. All right, cool. Another question from John. Um, my biggest issue with functional or anything similar is to find talent. How do you deal with this? I mean, you worked at a startup that was using Haskell. I mean, how the hell did you hire? Yeah, so that startup again, the the one I was working with Haskell, the CTO was very strong in Haskell, so he could assess quality engineers with the initial hiring. And then that team only ever got as big as five or six developers. So if you think you'll have it, and then at that moment already, we were having trouble hiring new Haskell talent. So I think if you expect to have a team bigger than five, uh, I wouldn't suggest going for one of these more hardcore pure functional languages. 
For the, these other ones though, the intermediate ones like TypeScript or something like that, I think there is also a chance if your developer pool, if you would consider people who studied engineering, a different engineering discipline, if you would be willing to teach them programming, sort of like uh, Daniel's point with teaching entrepreneurs programming, it's also easy to take people that have some mathematical familiarity, let's say a civil engineer, and to teach them programming, and they can more quickly get this, this advanced style because of the mathematical underpinnings. Um, but as well, I think, I think it's going to become more popular. I think it's a chicken and the egg. I think um, there's a lot of developers that are hungry to start doing some of these ideas. We've read too many blog posts about it, so we, we want to start doing it. So I think at some point, you're going to have a bigger problem of hiring developers that don't want to do functional programming, to be honest. Yeah, kind of chiming in on this one, I think you can use that to your advantage as well. Um, I wouldn't go maybe for something crazy like Haskell, but uh, at Unir, a company I worked uh, a while back, we actually ended up using Scala. We had huge volumes of, of data, so that was helpful. And then we had a lot of folks from the Java world that were interested in Scala kind of joining us. The same uh, or similar example I would give is NewBank, right, using Clojure. I think that created a lot of momentum and like a strong engineering culture in the beginning and they kind of riding that wave until now. Obviously having to train folks as they join, but uh, I think it, it gave them a lot of momentum early on. Yeah, um, and quick, and with Nubank, that's an interesting one with, sorry, Yuri, with Clojure, um, because sometimes to be honest, that's a good source to have a developer pool is if there's a big popular company in your area using a specific language like uh, Nubank in Sao Paulo or Brazil, once they're once they're a big enough company, no one's going to work there forever. So they'll start shedding uh, developers, and that's a potential source to find them. Totally. Um, I'm going to skip a few to go to another question because we have the next one would be from John again. But let's see if we can get um, another one. This is from Anonymous. So how would you apply these concepts that you presented today on the front end uh, of side of things? Yeah. Um, a lot, it, depending how much business logic you do in the front end, um, it might not be as applicable, but I still think that the front end is one of the best places for it, uh, for even more than functional for declarative style. And I think React is already very, a lot of these React and React-like frameworks are very declarative, right? You have a static description of what the component should look like, and then you let the React library handle passing the state and redrawing the virtual DOM and not. So I think is what is ready the and excuse me, I was trying to read the chat and talk at the same time. So when you have this, when you make things more declarative in the front end, it's easier to change technologies because you have more schemas or descriptions of what it should look like. And then you can operate on things more abstractly and it's easier to refactor. All right, awesome. I think uh, that about does it in terms of time where. We're at time, a um, few minutes short here. I'm gonna also kind of wrap it up. Thanks so much, Jared, for sharing your wisdom on the functional side. I definitely see that picking up today's market. Uh, so yeah, I I wanna thank everyone for joining tonight and uh, for kind of sticking with us. We know the functional programming is not for the faint of heart. Um, and then, yeah, I just wanted to share at Latitude, currently we do have some open roles. Um, specifically for senior or staff level front-end engineer and also information security specialist. Uh, if you know anyone or interested yourself, please apply at the careers.latitude.com. Um, you know, those, those folks ideally would come from regulated backgrounds, so legal tech, uh, fintech, stuff like that. And then I guess uh, skipping to the last slide here, um, yeah, if you want to kind of stay in touch with Latitude as a whole, feel free to subscribe to these, you know, uh, the newsletter. We have you know, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, and also the team is going to drop uh, a link for you in the chat. Uh, if you want to subscribe to the whole like Luma uh, sequence of these tech talks. So we'll see you in the future once. Yeah, spread the word and uh, hopefully this was useful. Please let us know on the CSAT how we did. And yeah, we're excited to see you on the next one.